And welcome aboard the Winnipeg Terminal. I'm not Mike D'Andrea. He is at home with his new baby girl, Lauren. Everything is fine. She is the, the newest Jets fan that we know of. But I do have a show for you this week. And I brought in uh, Robert Dalton from the Rouge Radio podcast to join up and talk some Winnipeg sports. Yeah, and uh, it's, it's a new venture. Usually I stick to CFL football, but I'm looking forward to talking about uh yeah, and for and for the Jets, it's not like we don't have anything to talk about, right? Trade deadline was just at the end of last week. Uh, Tyler Toffoli mm-hmm. and Colin Miller came in. First game that they're in the lineup, a three to nothing shutout over the Washington Capitals. That and the team looked great doing it. So I think it's pretty safe to say we can uh, say that both trades are wins right now, and uh, never t- never speak of this again, right? Yeah, I mean, I mean, if you think about it, I mean, here, here's here's the kicker. When when it was told that the return for Tyler Toffoli was a a third round pick this year and a second round pick next year, I thought, oh, that's a steal. And then it was revealed that the the Jets actually had to give up one of those picks. For New Jersey to retain their salary, I mean, I, I, I gotta, I gotta give uh, a shout out to General Manager Kevin Shovelday for, for for managing to pull that off, and then he sends off a fourth round pick in twenty twenty six for Colin Miller. I mean, I don't care if either one of these guys resign; uh, you know, they're both UFAs after this uh, playoff run. Uh, I, I don't care if if they're not if they're not able to 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 resign both of those guys. Those trades. Are gonna like bravo, kudos to Shovel Day out for pulling those off because uh, you know you're you're not gonna you know in two years time you're not even gonna think about that third round pick or that second round pick in 2025. It, it, it shouldn't even matter. No, I mean, even when we were discussing Sean Monahan about a month ago, we were like, we'll never talk about mm-hmm. the first round pick we gave up if the playoffs go really well, will we? Uh, yeah, I, I, we talk about. If if the Jets make that trade for Sean Monahan, they're probably not giving up a first for that one. Just based off what everybody got or what everybody was being traded for, if Sean Monahan, if that trade happens a month after, uh, they're probably giving up that second round pick that they got from from Montreal and the for uh, Montreal second round pick that they got from LA and the Pierre Luc Dubois deal. Like you're not giving up that first round pick, but you know what? I'm not complaining about that one because you know it's paid dividends right now. Sean Monahan is—I don't even know if it's streaky, but scoring at, at a mile a minute, um, he's just—he's become a force in the face-off circle, which is something that the Jets haven't seen in, in quite some time, and, and uh, it makes them very, very deep at the center position down the line on all four lines now. That it does, and it woke up a power play that was just completely powerless to steal a term. It, it's yeah. like two months straight of just like, oh, here comes the power play. Let's go. Time time to go grab some popcorn and hit the rest. <laughs> no, can't do that anymore. I, I'm, glad, I'm glad of it. Yeah. And and I used to make a joke on, on Twitter that if, uh, if they, like, there was, there was uh, I mean, the first off, the joke was like, well, you know, Let's, you know, as soon as the power play, let's go watch something else on TV for two minutes because you, you weren't going to witness a goal. You weren't going to witness anything exciting. There wasn't going to be like shot after shot after shot. And if you did, they would be right at the goalie. Um, but, uh, but that's changed. You know, also, you know, fans would be like, hey, you know, something, you know, uh, a player would take a cheap shot or whatever and wouldn't get called or a trip of player, trip a jet wouldn't get called. And fans would be booing. And my comment to that would be like, what are you booing for? Like, it's not as if the Jets are going to go into power play and then score a goal. They were, they were just abysmal. They were putrid. No. And at uh, that point they were yeah, the most dominant team in the league five on five. So you didn't want them to get out of that. Now. Exactly. Monahan, yeah. <laughs> yeah. With Monaghan in place with some of the injuries they've been dealing with, the five on five game has been slipping a little, little bit, but the power plays come around. So they're actually scoring more than they were before. Yeah, and one special teams has been has been killer since uh, the turn of the calendar. Like even penalty kill, like I think they rank like 
were like in the lower echelon of, of the league overall. But I think since January 1st, their penalty kill has been very, very, very strong. And ever since the acquisition of Sean Monahan, and then uh, now you add Tyler Toffoli to the mix, at your power play when the officials decide to call penalties in the playoffs should be very, very, very good. Yeah, very good. And we still haven't seen this team at full strength. Uh, there's always been a lingering injury or two. Mm-hmm. It's going to be really interesting to see what happens when all the pieces are in place, if that ever does happen. Yeah, and uh, I mean, Gabriel Velarde is is having like a week or a day-to-day. If I'm Rick Bonus, maybe give him an extra week just to heal up a little bit. You, at this rate, I think it's almost like a foregone conclusion you're going to make the playoffs. It may be even a foregone conclusion that you host, like you have home home ice advantage at least in the first round. Maybe give him another week. Maybe give him this home stand just to heal up and then have him come on, uh, you know, have them start when they when they leave uh, for the road next week. It's just it, it it's you've got all these options available for you right now, so you don't. It, it's not needed to rush a guy of uh, of uh, Velarde's value. No, and when your next three are Predators, Ducks, and then at Columbus, you're not exactly mm-hmm. looking at the top of the league here either. Well, I mean the the Preds tomorrow. Uh, they they are pretty they're they're pretty streaky right now they're they're I think they're like ten and two in their last twelve or something ridiculous like that. Uh, I think Burnett's got that team playing very 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 good. Although we still have to start looking at the the opposition for Nashville. Um, in those cases, they have beaten some very decent teams, but they've also had the had the luck of beating some teams that are not exactly, you know. They're, they're already in next year territory uh, right now. But uh, Nashville is kind of sneaky good. It wouldn't surprise me if they catch Winnipeg off guard. Um, but I'm in the same boat as you. I think the next three games, you know, you got Nashville, uh, Anaheim, and Columbus. Why why would you rush, you know, a Gabe Velarde back? You, you essentially have at least, in my opinion, I don't want to give bulletin board material, you have at least a guarantee four out of six points. Are you going to rush Gabe Velarde just to just to maybe solidify those six points for the next six uh, uh, the six out of six possible points? I, I don't know if that's uh, if that's great asset management. No, and and if it comes and if it comes down to it, I'm sure they'll make the right decision as far as what's good mm-hmm. for the team going forward. I mean, if he's ready, don't set him. But at the same time. Got to see what you got. The sooner you get them back too, the more you can start playing with the lines again, seeing what works best. It seems like there's been a lot of, it seems like there's a change on a daily basis as to who's on the top line, who's on the second line, who's on the fourth. Third line seems like it's going to be pretty stable. I'm I'm not going to complain about that at all because that line is going to do. But it's going to be interesting to see how they slot all these pieces in together once they have them all in hand. It, it, it's yeah. I mean, and when everything is, when everybody is all healthy, likely that first game, when it, with everybody healthy, is probably not going to be the lineup that you see in the playoffs. Because, like I said, they've got a lot of options to play with. They could put Tyler Toffoli and Ehlers with Shifley on the first line. They could put Tyler Toffoli and uh, Kyle Connor with Sean Monahan. Um, on the second line, I think they have those options available. And you know, if you're Colorado, who you you know could could be your your first round opponent, or if you're Vegas, I mean, God forbid, even Vegas uh, it, it goes into depending on where Winnipeg. But like that first round matchup with Winnipeg scares me offensively because now like it's going to be very, very, very tough to match up with not just the first and third line, but now you got to match up with possibly all four lines. Yeah, because you, you, you're playing Vlad Nemeshnikov on the fourth line at times, and he can be mm-hmm. anywhere on this team. It's a, it's, it's just, yeah. it's a luxury to have him go, okay, we've got three, we've got three great lines, and we also have Vlad Nemeshnikov on the fourth line. Like, 
that's just an <laughs> embarrassment of riches right now. A whole lot of options. A whole lot of options, yeah. Yeah. If, if, if the Jets end up getting swept, it's not it, – it's uh, in the first round or any round. It's it's not going to be for lack of trying. It's not going to be for the lack of talent. It's simply is is the other team is just going to be flat out better than them. And that's yeah. that's going to be the end game. But I think that this team has has the coaching. I think they've got the talent, and I've got, I think they have the depth. Um, and the schemes and whatnot, uh, the structure, too – possibly go all the way not necessarily a Stanley Cup parade but at least be amongst the final four at the very least they've uh, a lot of teams in the western fi- uh, western conference got better i i think winnipeg was good they definitely got better with the additions of Tofoli and Colin Miller if you like like you said if you add to the point where now you've got Vlad Nemestikov on the fourth line you're, you're, you've done good. You've gotten to the point where you've added depth on your D line to where Nathan Schmidt is a healthy scratch. You've done something. Uh, so, I mean, kudos for, for Kevin shovel for, for pulling off those trades and not having it, not only not, not having to give up uh, a player, but not even having to give up a prospect too. So that future is still, is still set. So even if they don't play, if they don't end up a, uh, Signing to Foley or Colin Miller, they still have got Billy Hainola for next year. They've still got, um, I'm trying to think, maybe even Rucker McGordy, depending on if, they, if he signs a, an entry level contract this year. Please take him as fast as you can. We right. want him out of Michigan, please. <laughs> <laughs> I was just, I was waiting for that comment. Man, those, uh, those uh, Michigan uh, Wisconsin games must be held for you. <laughs> Man, it's just, well, if he does well, I know that the, the future is bright. Mm-hmm. Uh, and one other thing I'm noticing Chevrolet up doing is he's staggering these draft picks too. He hasn't stripped yeah. the draft class out. It's a pick in 2024. It's a pick in 2025. It's a pick in 2026. So you're going to have a hole in your top four rounds for the next three years. But if you're competing, that's not going to matter anyway because those picks are going to be a lot lower than they were. They would be if you weren't. Yeah, and, and also to keep in mind that a lot of people are going to focus on, well, the Jets don't have their first round because they send them to, to, to uh, Montreal for Sean Monahan. They're saying, well, they don't have their second round because they send it last year for uh, for Needle Needle Rider. They don't have their third because they send it for Tyler Toffoli. They don't have their fourth, uh, and, and, and so on and so forth. That They do have a pick in the second round because it was belonged to Montreal that was shipped to L.A., what we got in the Pierre Luc Dubois deal, that should be a very high second round pick. So the difference between where they finish in the first round to where Montreal finishes could be as much as ten spots, could be as little as five spots. So that trade is the gift Jets, that keeps on giving too. Yes, exactly. I, I like I. I don't know if you if you follow trade trees, but Evander King. Traded, what was it, nine years ago? If you follow trade trees, the Jets still have from that Evander Kane trade tree, the stem or the routes or the, the, the roots, they have Billy Hainola, Neil Pionk, they've got Harrison Blydell, who is, uh, I don't even know if he's even part of their, their organization. Uh, they had Declan Chisholm, who they they lost on waivers to Minnesota earlier this year, but now they've, they've got that. They've now got Gabe Velarde, Alex Iofalo. They've got Rasmus Kupari and that second round pick that was with Montreal. Um, yeah. Winnipeg is just the Kevin shovel day off is, is just every year he's making not necessarily the big, you know, flame, or, you know the big electric kind of electricity type trades, but every now and then, every now and then, he's just building, soli- he's solidifying the future of the Winnipeg Jets. Case in point, yeah, he's traded away a couple of draft picks, but he's not trading roster players, and he still has his prospects. You, you know, those. That's the definition of all in, in my opinion. Definition of all in. Right. And then you're still giving yourself something to work with in the future if this doesn't pan out, which, I mean, the playoffs exactly. are like an animal. 
we'll see. But I can't. I I just remember <laughs> sitting it sitting in an A and W on Banjo Bowl weekend, talking with my with my buddy, and just be like, "This season could go so many different ways, but I don't see any of them being mm-hmm. good." Well, it shows what I know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's funny. Like uh, there was so there was you know if you last year it was you know they they had the, that completely playing out of their minds. Everybody was like, oh my God, what are the Jets doing? They're like, just, they're phenomenal. And then they had this little tailspin until the last couple of weeks of the, the regular season. And then they went out in five games. And so, you know, then of course, everybody was like, okay, are, go- are they going to trade Hellebuck? Are they going to trade Shifley? Those are, those guys have one year left on, on their current contract. Are we going to walk them to free agency? Um, Pierre-Luc Dubois wanted out. And then all of a sudden, they re-signed Shifley. They re-signed Hellebuck. Dubois gets sent out. Wheeler gets bought out. And now you've got like an influx of young, talented players in Kupari and Velarde and veteran leadership in Ayafalo. And now all of a sudden, boom, you're tops of the league. You're at least top five for the, for the majority of the season. And now you're adding Sean Monahan, Tyler Toffoli, and Colin Miller. Like, I, I, exactly. Let's go back. I, like I, I know, I'm just kind of repeating the, this 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 whole thing, but it, it it it's worth repeating because, like I said, that's definition of being all in right now. Like the Jets, and what's amazing is their window is still open. Like yeah. like I said, if they don't sign Monahan and uh, to Foley or Miller after this year, they've still got Perfetti. To, to to take over somewhere in that second or third spot, they've got uh, McGord McGordy. They thought they they've got Lambert coming in. Nola, there is that plethora of 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 young players that are just chomping at the wood to get get into this lineup next year. And mm-hmm. and if they happen to resign one or two of the three, that gives their their young prospects ample time to to learn even more. In the, in the system, whether it's at the Manitoba Moose or even, you know, even on the bench or, you know, up in the press box, just learning, just being around it just gives you that, uh, that opportunity to just to learn and just kind of just absorb everything that you're, that you're being a part of. Yeah. And the four moves over the summer were franchise defining moves and any single one of them could have been very impactful and very hurtful and every single one paid <laughs> off in spades. That's, that's knowing what you want and going and getting it. Yep. All in, all in. <laughs> well, we, we, uh, there's also another team we both like that are going to be all in for at least the next couple of seasons here. Uh, Winnipeg got through, or the bombers got through CFL free agency with some dings and dents, but I don't think they lost any foundational pieces. Do you? Hmm. So, I'm uh, I'm I'm in this group message with uh, with a couple of my cousins, friends, and whatnot. And I think the more that we talked about, you know, maybe having a little bit of regression, the more that we kind of convinced ourselves that no, we're no, this is just getting younger and being more stable. I think what really kind of hurts Winnipeg is the loss of Jamarcus Hardrick and not having that projected starter in Drew Richmond available, which is why I think that they went out and got guys like Eric Lofton, um, getting guys uh, from, from, from uh, you know, a little bit of a NFL experience or maybe Uf, USFL experience. Um, I felt that maybe the Drew Richmond retirement caught, caught him off guard. Uh, but overall, I mean, if you really look at the guys that they've lost, they've they've replaced them with guys with experience. Like uh, you look at Winston Rose, Winston Rose is probably leaving as a, as a free agent or retirement. Winston Rose is being replaced by Terrell Ford, right? I mean, he's he's got that experience. He was with the Bombers for twenty twenty two, had a little dip in the NFL with the Packers, came back. He's got experience. Uh, Jackson Jeffco is retired. He's being replaced by Celestin Haba, who has experience. 
not a, a lot of experience, but experience is experience. Whether it's one, two, or three years, it's experience. Uh, I'm trying to think of another guy, Rashid Bailey going. Well, he's going to be replaced by probably someone who's been in, who's with the, the team last year. We don't know who's, who's going to be that fifth receiver spot, but, you know, like a guy by the name of like maybe Ravi Alston, who played a little bit last year after the Bombers solidified first in the West. He played a little bit in the uh, in the in week 18 or week 20, uh, the 18th game. I can't remember if it was week 21 or week 22. Um, but, the, you know, the, the Bombers are not going to be playing. Like people are saying, well, well they're going to they're, they're, they're have that regression because they lost their starters. Well, they're replacing them internally and not only internally but like i said with, with guys with experience so and, and i'm not gonna say with I, the I, organization I'm not, that know how it's how it works and what their role is in the it, yeah ex- yeah exactly i mean uh red crown day is probably going to be the projected starter at the sam linebacker he wasn't the projected starter last year but he played pretty darn good uh, as the season progressed last year so, I mean, and, and the fact is that the, the, the Winnipeg Blue Bombers are going to have eight draft picks this year, I, I believe. Um, you know, we, uh, it's, and they're, you're going to have projected eight starters, Canadian starters, on, on, their, on their team. They're, you can talk about the regression because they lost some guys. I think this team is just set to take another leap of being another four or five years about being competitive for tops in the West. Uh, I, yeah, that's, and, and then we haven't even gotten to the Chris Trevler factor yet. No, I mean, you know, it sucks. It sucks that they lost Drew Brown. Ideally, they get Drew Brown back in 2026 when that two year deal in Ottawa is back. But, uh, you know, I guess that depends on how that's his time in Ottawa goes. But, uh, you know, the Bombers are not going to be sitting. Like when people say that, but you know they're going to be you know this regression because they lost some starters. I, the 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 comments are as if they're going to be replaced with rookies, and that's just not the case. Yeah, the bombers are going to be uh, there. It's going to be a different team. Did no if ands or buts about that, but they're still going to be an experienced team, and you need that experience in the CFL, especially when you're going to be competitive with teams like BC and teams that are just like, just chomping at the bit to be better in Edmonton and Saskatchewan. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, and there was just now, there was no big lot. Like I bet anybody was expecting Oliver, one of Oliver or Sean to be gone. Honestly, I was thinking it was going to be Sean that was going to be gone. And they get him. Oh, me back. too. Yeah. I, yeah. Amazing. Good work for Kyle Walters, in my opinion. Yeah. I, I just remember it's like, why is everybody freaking out about Oliveira leaving? It's, it's a it's a, a a foregone conclusion that he was that he was coming back. Dalton Schoen resigning surprised the hell out of me. I I thought that if you managed to get both, you were there was some very 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 very. Um, I, I, I don't know if you just couldn't like very like convince Sean to come back on a cheap deal, but to see what he got on the market or what was available on the market to see what he what he eventually signed for. Um yeah, kudos to, to Kyle Walters for, for managing to get both those contracts signed because that team just became still a very, very scary team offensively. They're gonna be mm-hmm. some very they're they're gonna be some very good defenses next year. Here that are going to be picking up their jog straps because Brady Oliveira ran through them, and Dalton Schultz still managed to get himself open. Right, and I I have to wonder uh, the wide receiver position seemed to get have a little bit of a regression in how much the top guys were getting because Tim White was out there for a for a week or two, wanting that mm-hmm. thirty three hundred k, and he wasn't getting that. So I wonder if the whole position was devalued a little bit this off season, which uh, went into the Bombers' hands. I don't know if the problem is, is that in years past, there was probably like maybe a few good to great receivers that were available in 
if we're talking about the upper echelon of receivers, there was only two available, Dalton Schoen and Tim White. And Tim White was probably never going to leave Hamilton, and he was never going to leave Hamilton for less than what he got. And, that, uh, you know, if there was a team that was going to say, hey, I want to pay you three hundred grand, then by more power, by, by all means, why wouldn't Tim White sign that contract? The issue is that, like I said, there was only two receivers that were considered to be on that level of 250 plus for a season. And once Dalton Schoen signed with, uh, what was he at? Two, 230? I want to say that he got stuck in my head. Yeah. Yeah. Um, once Dalton Schoen signed for 230, Tim White was not ever going to get a sniff close to 300. And what he, he signed. Point. Yeah, at that once Sean signed for that, it was just he, it was done for for Tim White. So I think he got as much about as much as he was he was able to get out of Hamilton. But uh, I think Dalton Sean signing for what he did kind of did Tim White. Not saying that one receiver is better than the other, but you're going to be hard pressed to say that Tim White is seventy thousand dollars better than Dalton Sean. Yeah, that's probably this not is what you know, it's be hard. No. Yeah. yeah. No, so. The market played into the Bombers' hands there. And I also wonder if the money that they had earmarked for Hardrick becoming available helped them make that call. That's uh, do we my, stop? Honestly, that's you... my speculation, but it, kind of, it makes sense because as soon as Hardrick was gone, oh, turn around. Oh, there's Alton Schoen. Okay, great. Wow, great. <laughs> I, uh, you, I don't know if you remember, but I think it was like a couple, maybe even that day, the great cup loss or whatever media interviewed Michael Shea and Michael Shea during the exit interview said that there was a few players that were going to be that hinted at retirement. And when you said few, I was thinking five and I thought, okay, uh, Jackson Jeff Coat was one of them that I thought Brandon Alexander was another one. Winston Rose was another one. And then I actually pegged, both Stanley Bryant Jr. and Jamarcus Hardrick as the other two that were going to be. Um, and then once they just start, they signed Willie. Uh, they signed Stanley Bryant. And I thought, okay, all right, maybe Hardrick is gone. And then Hardrick signed. So I'm, I'm really starting to maybe, like, maybe Stanley Bryant has bonuses in his contract that he could sign for kind of like at a cheap and then get those bonuses. Because I gun to my head, I don't know if I would have picked Stanley Bryant over Jamarcus Hardrick at this point. Like I'm really surprised that they that's how everything went. Um, you know, because if if it turned out that you lost Jamarcus Hardrick because of forty grand, I don't uh, I I don't know. I you know he's he's got this infectious leadership in the locker room. He's good. He, obviously his best years are behind him, but I'd still, I'd still want Jamarcus Hardrick at 34 over Stanley Bryan at 38 for, for one year. Uh, but that, I mean, but that's just me, but um, I, I can't remember what the original question was with before I went on my little tirade. No, it's all apologize. good. It's all good. Cause I was thinking <laughs> I got, I got um, a head in my head that Hardrick was, and it's compl- I have no reason to believe this, but I believe that I, I kind of had the thought that Hardrick would have been the priority signing over Schoen mm-hmm. because they have such de- depth at wide receiver. But once Hardrick left, it opened up the money for Schoen. So I think, words. yeah, I think they were prepared to move on from Hardrick at the money he wanted because they had Drew Richmond in place. I think what really, really hurts them is the fact that now that that replacement is no longer in place. And I think that really probably makes everything that you you, you fans galore would look in hindsight. Hindsight's twenty twenty. You say, well, the Bombers are going to not do too well because they lost Hardrick. Losing Hardrick was not the be all end all. Great player, but I think. The, the loss of Richmond, because once you start getting to that third string tackle, that's when things fall apart. I think Drew Richmond, who played a couple of games in the last uh, last few years, 
showed really good potential that he's able to to uh, to hold up against the you know the top notch or the top echelon of the defensive ends that he'll have to play. Uh, it's just unfortunate that he decided to retire at the time that he did. Right, and kind of going back to our previous point, they were filling every slot where they had a where mm. they had a player going with somebody that had been in the organization, knew the program, knew what was going on. That's one of the holes that they don't that they won't be able to do that. And the other hole seems to be kick returner because they brought in they brought in a kid from Rutgers, I believe. I can't remember the name off the top of my head. And I haven't heard a thing about Janarian Grant. So I wonder if that's the other hole the team will have without CFL experience. Yeah. Uh, I I was and my thought process was they were going to because Janarian Grants has been injured for the last couple of years. Uh, still good, still phenomenal, but he's been injured. Um, and because he was probably playing on the cheap part, putting him on the sixth game is not really at that point. Putting him on a sixth game is not going to save you money. Yeah, it's really not helping you. So uh, you you need someone who, regardless of the contract, who's going to be reliable. And I think KJ Hill is the guy that the, that they brought in, who's going to be you know trying out for that fifth. I think it's KJ Hill that they that they brought in from yeah, Ohio for, State. Yeah, uh, very recently. That uh, yeah, that, that they were going to bring in uh, has a little bit of a uh, of, uh, returning pedigree. But what I'm surprised is the Bombers didn't look at Lucky Whitehead, who's currently a free agent, uh, who's still a free agent because he fills all the boxes. Um, he's less, more reliable than Janarian Grant on the health wise, but he fills the boxes and he knows the system because he was with the team, albeit five years ago, but he was still with the team. Um, phenomenal returner and a very good receiver. We saw I, I think the only season. reason I could see not to bring him back beyond the money, of course, because we don't we, <laughs> we don't have the Excel spreadsheet that says they have X amount left, so it's hard to speculate that way. But he didn't seem they, they seem not to know how to use him in 2019. So what would change now? Because he, the lucky yeah, whitehead it, playbook in 2019 was jet sweep on the first drive and then maybe see him one more on a deep ball later in the game, and that's all you'd ever see him. Yeah, and, and it's amazing. They had well, they had Lucky Whitehead and Charles Nelson as returners that year. And for the life of me, I don't remember injuries happening. Maybe they had a guy. Maybe they kind of uh, missed the game. And then all of a sudden, they just felt the need to pluck uh, Janarian Grant away from Hamilton. And then the, the rest is history. Like once Janarian Grant made his debut and had those two punt return touchdowns against Calgary, uh, in 2019, Lucky Whitehead, you just you just could because you, you, as a fifth or fourth or fifth receiver back in 2019, it just it just wasn't going to work out for him. He needed to have that extra versatility as a returner, and he wasn't going to get a chance with generic granted stuff. So I mean, now things you know that opportunity is there, but I mean, if they haven't signed them yet, probably not going to happen. I mean, if free agency was what like a month ago. Like yeah. almost a month ago, we're, we're, we're chance, yeah, month, it's it's month into it, yeah, yeah. It's chance if if it hasn't happened yet, it's not going to happen. Now, having said that, Kyle Walters has shown a pension of signing a a free agent, you know, that that coup d'état or whatever, like a big under the radar signing, like weeks before training camp. Like we, what was it, twenty eighteen? He signed Big Hill. Uh, the year be the year after that, it was, uh, oh man, who was it? It was, it was someone. And then he signed Bryant Mitchell in 2000, uh, 2021. And then Mitchell ended up retiring because it wasn't the, you know, the season didn't get a go at for, for whatever. So he ended up retiring. So Walters does have a penchant of having this under the radar free agent signing, you know, come April and May. So, his heavy working might might have already been done just by re-signing everybody that, that, that he has. Um, but I, I don't think he's really 100% done 
per se. So I think there's the, I think there's this one little asterisk that he's just waiting just to to, to bring in for training camp this year. There's one more you think? Okay, I could see yeah. that. There's a couple spots that would that would definitely benefit. So mm-hmm. we'll have to we'll have to see what comes of it. Based, I I'm pretty confident. I, I feel like there's I feel like the team is all in for the next two years. And then it'll be a we'll see they, after November 2025. They, they better be, because I tell you what, losing Drew Brown now for this year doesn't doesn't that doesn't matter to me. Losing Drew Brown for 2026 and because I the the worst thing in the world is that you could run into a situation where you make you choose the the current starter over the guy who you have full uh, confidence in, um, and then losing both eventually, right? So what I'm hoping is Drew Brown has a very good tenure in Ottawa for the next two years, and becomes Winnipeg's highlighted free agent acquisition for 2026, because if Claros has an off year. Not even this year, but next year. That decision to not sign Drew Brown that would that could that could turn sideways pretty fast. It, it certainly could, but I, I I I believe the the quiet thing going on with the Strebler signing is you've got your backup and your third down back third down quarterback in one person, mm-hmm. so you can spare that third roster quarterback roster spot mm-hmm. for a guy that you can groom for the next two years. I mean, I'm just oh, yeah. I'm thinking not, ahead to yeah, like I, a magical Hollywood ending. Winnipeg wins the Grey Cup at home or at least gets there 2025, mm-hmm. a bunch of players. At some point, the core is going to have to go. Just Mother, Na- or, um, Mother Nature's undefeated, unfortunately. But they have the, now they have those two years to plan for 2026 at the quarterback position. So I hope they, I hope they're making the moves that they need to be making at that point for it. Yeah. And I think the, the addition of Chris Traveler for 2024, like I said, losing Drew Brown for this year doesn't matter. Right. He wasn't going to play enough to become a factor. And we got Chris Traveler. Are we going to trust Chris Traveler in two years? If he's still, if he's not going into CFO is, Chris Trevor going to be the starter in 2026? That's I sure hope that he's. I sure hope that he's improved enough. I got. I got to tell you, I I think one of the, the one of the most misleading comments I've seen on on Twitter is Chris Trevor's a bad quarterback. I disagree with that wholeheartedly. He is not a bad quarterback. Where I probably would fall in line with the majority of people is that I don't think he's a starter. Like he's not a no. starter material right now. Um, no, but he has I, his I, value. And no. He has his place, and it's mm-hmm. right where he is right now. Yeah, and exactly, which is why losing Drew Brown doesn't concern me. But twenty twenty six, what's going to happen? Are we going to rely on because Kolaris is not going to play past twenty twenty five, or at least he should. Not Strebler, not. yeah, is is Strebler going to be a starter in twenty twenty six? Don't know. Eric uh, Barrier that, or Barrier. Right, yeah. He might be the next guy. He might be the guy that groomed for two yeah. years if they like him. If if Eric Barrier is uh is shows, you know, meets that potential that I've seen from highlights, then we're not having this conversation in two years. Um, and I sure but, hope we're not. Uh, again. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> we don't need to relive like the the Reinbold years or the Mike Kelly years all over again. the 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 last six years have been pretty decent if if you're a Bomber fan. I mean, no, we'll, losing we'll, we'll the Grey Cups, I'll be damned. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> if you, I mean, if you would have walked it walked up to me in at the beginning of 2019 and said, "You're getting to the Grey Cup the next four years, you're winning two or next four seasons." Let's be fair; there was a year missing there mm-hmm. um the next four seasons you're gonna win two of them a sign right here immediately right yeah and and what's surprising and i know it's going off topic 
But when they ended that Great Cup drought in 2019, I was so ecstatic. Obviously, you were ecstatic. Too. Every Bomber fan was ecstatic. There was a part of me that thought, okay, this group, just, they, the entire group could retire of ending a 29-year Grey Cup drought. The fact that they re-signed like 99% of them back for 2021, I was like, are you out of your flipping minds? Like, these are guys who are going to... And then they just kept on resigning and resigning and resigning. I'm like, oh, okay, so holy crap, this this is just like, this is phenomenal. We're like, we're in the midst of, I don't want to use the term dynasty, but this, we're in the, we're in a, in the middle of an era, right? We're an O'Shea era. Like, that, that's, I'll, I'll stick with that one. Like, we're in the middle of a, an, a golden O'Shea era where we can look back on this, like, you know what? I was alive. I remember this. I remember this time. This is just these phenomenal are, times to be a These are bomber. the years we're going to be telling our grandkids about. Exactly. Right. Like I like I don't know about you. Like when you started watching the the CFL or even the Bombers, but like for for me, it was like growing up in Mike Riley, right, and Cal Murphy in the in the late eighties, early nineties, and then of course you had the uh, the the Reinbold years, and like it, it it's like the ninety seven ninety eight season was just so bad. He just re, it, like the the glory day, the glory years, kind of seemed like twenty years ago. I mean, that's just par for the course for growing up. And then when Dave Ritchie signed him, God, you know, rest in peace, Dave Ritchie, when he arrived on the scene in Winnipeg in, in 1999, it just got, it, it just brought everything back. And like when, when that, when that 2001 team, that defense was just putting up record breaking numbers, it just brought back nostalgia from the defense of the eighties. Right. I mean, so it's, you know, it's, what the, the point is, is that we're like, we don't know when this current era is going to end, but when it does end, we're going to wish that we, that we kind of embraced it as it was, because when it does end, could be next year, could be the year after when it does end, possibly that we're going to be experiencing a couple of years where it'd be like, Hey, we should have appreciated this era a lot more than we did. Day after Banjo Bowl was a fan appreciation out of the stadium, so we went down there, mm. and we just sat in some of those right at the top of the first, um, right on top of the lower bowl. Um, there's just the seats with um, right right by the gates where I think I'm trying to remember. It's like the, you go down into them a little bit, so we just picked mm -hmm. a spot to get out of the traffic for a bit and just sat there just stared out there and just went like yeah in about five years we're going to be wishing we were sitting here right now so let's just have let's just let's just sit here for 10 minutes and just take it in and just like this is this is the time that we that we waited for yeah we're gonna we're gonna be sitting there in uh princess auto stadium <laughs> just just just, uh, just wishing to, to, to think back to the glory days, the glory years of IGF. Yeah, are we going to be calling it the Toolbox, or have we come up with a name yet? Uh, I don't know. Uh, it's, 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 like I, For you who lives out of town, for, for fans who visit who are out of town, yeah, I, I could get it. Like For me, I've, I've never said, hey, let's go meet up at IGF, or let's go meet up at Princess Auto Stadium. It'll it's always just be either the stadium or the bomber stadium. That's always it's, it's what it's been. So I mean, so in, in that case, if it, if if a company is just going to say, "Hey, I'm going to pay you 500 grand for 10 years or whatever the money uh, the amount of money is," if I'm going to take it, it's free money, it's free money for a community owned team. Take it. It, uh, it doesn't matter if if fans or other teams are going to make fun of it for what. Or if fan, or even your own fans are going to make fun of it. You don't need it. Nobody really is going to get, get concerned themselves over the name of the stadium because they've never referred to it as, as such. Like Winnipeg yeah. Stadium, like back in the Canada Inn Stadium, never, not even, not a, not a hush. Always been the stadium, the Bomber Stadium. It's always been that, unless you're like a, like I said, unless you are an outsider. Even as an outsider, you just say, hey, let's go to the bomber stadium or whatever. 
Like the only people that are really going to be pronouncing Princess Auto Stadium or whatever the name of the stadium are play-by-play guys. That's all yep. it is. The guys that get paid. Really, right? like, exactly. Right. So no harm, no foul. And the Bombers are richer just for, for doing it. They still haven't, yeah. but they still haven't uh, changed the outside of the stadium. It, there's still IGF is still plastered all over the stadium. So oh, I'm, I'm Princess sure that's going to be a costly thing to do. Yes. Oh, I definitely, but I was just kind of like, so that deal ran out last year. The Princess Otter thing started in February. The season starts in May. Might want to hurry up on this. <laughs> they got two months. They'll get it done yeah. in August. <laughs> well, just they'll they'll start late, just like how they started late on the construction of IG Field. <laughs> well, you got you got one more year out of out of the old place for it, right? Got to say yeah. goodbye. <laughs> Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, I think I think we've uh, exhausted that topic, and I think both of us are pretty exhausted because we're shooting this a lot later than we used than I'm used to doing it anyway. So, any final thoughts? Before yeah. We get out of here. Uh, other than that, I just uh, you know what, H- hockey in Winnipeg is my my goal. And what, what, what I think was really perfect for the 2018, the, that 2017, 2018 Jets is, yeah, it ended it prematurely than what we wanted to. But I just remember that game five happened the day of training camp opening for Winnipeg for the Bombers. So if we could have that this year, it, you know what, as much as I want them to win the Stanley Cup, if there could be no lulls in Winnipeg sporting the <laughs> timeline, um, I'm all for it. So if Winnipeg just ends up taking uh, the round two to uh, seven games and then Bomber training camp starts the next day, I'm, I'm all for it. So, yeah, that's it, a was a, it was a very – That's a great goal. I'm yeah. in. I'm in. <laughs> yeah, that's uh, – it's uh, I, I know it's, a, it's a, a low standard for Winnipeg, but I tell you what, to have that excitement – it just even as if it ends negatively, but just to have something just automatically take because the worst thing you want to do is just kind of lull everything over about a playoff defeat, right? And just have ah oh, crap, bomber stick. I got to wait another month to become happy again. <laughs> this uh, it's it's almost depressing, kind of, but yeah, if we can have that the repeat of the 2017 2018 year, I won't complain. All right. I, I like that goal. That'll keep us with stuff to talk about the whole year, too. I'm all for it. Exactly. All right. Well, we'll we'll be uh, landing this thing, and we'll be catching you next week on the Winnipeg, Winnipeg Terminal.